Thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was wandering in the Magadhan country, eventually arrived at Rajagaha. There he went to the potter Bhagava and said to him, If it is not inconvenient for you, Bhagava, I will stay one night in your workshop. It is not inconvenient for me, venerable sir, but there is a homeless one already staying there. If he agrees, then stay as long as you like, venerable sir. Now, uh, there was a clansman named Pukusati who had gone forth from the home life into homelessness out of faith in the Blessed One. Pukusati was actually a king. And he got to meet King Pasanadi and was very impressed with him and asked him who he followed. And then they talked about the Buddha a bit, and then they went on their merry way. Well, they started writing to each other. And King Pasanati was writing on gold plates, and he was reciting the teachings of the Buddha. And it got Pukusati so inspired that he gave up his kingdom, put on the robes, started looking for the Buddha. When the Blessed One went to the Venerable Pukusati and said to him, If it is not inconvenient for you, monk, I will stay one night in the workshop. The potter's workshop is large enough, friend, let the Venerable stay as long as he likes. Then the Blessed One entered the potter's uh, workshop, prepared a, a, a spread of grass at one end, and sat down, folding his legs crosswise, setting his body erect and establishing mindfulness in front of him. Then the Blessed One spent most of the night seated in meditation, and the Venerable Pukusati also spent the night seated in meditation. Then the Blessed One thought, this clansman conducts himself in a way that inspires confidence. Suppose I were to question him. So he asked the Venerable Pukusati, under whom have you gone forth, monk? Who is your teacher? Whose Dhamma do you profess? Friend, there is the recluse Gotama, the son of the Sakyans, who went forth from the Sakyan clan. Now, good report of that blessed Gotama has been spread to this effect. The blessed one is accomplished, fully awakened, perfect in true knowledge and conduct, sublime knower of worlds, incomparable leader of persons to be tamed, teacher of gods and humans, awakened and blessed. I have gone forth under that blessed one. That blessed one is my teacher. I profess the Dhamma of that blessed one. But monk, where is the blessed one, accomplished and fully awakened, now living? There is, friend, a city in the northern country named Sawati. The Blessed One, accomplished and fully awakened, is now living there. But monk, have you ever seen the Blessed One before? Would you recognize him if you saw him? No, friend, I've never seen the Blessed One before. 
nor would I recognize him if I saw him. Then the Blessed One thought, this clansman has gone forth from the home life into homeless under me, homelessness under me. Suppose I were to teach him the Dhamma. So the Blessed One addressed the Venerable Pukusati. Thus, monk, I will teach you the Dhamma. Listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, friend, the Venerable Pukusati replied. The Blessed One said this, Monk, this person consists of five elements, six bases of contact, 18 kinds of mental exploration and has four foundations. The tides of conceiving do not sweep over one who stands upon these foundations. When the tides of conceiving no longer sweep, sweep over him, he is called a sage at peace. One should not neglect wisdom should preserve truth, should cultivate relinquishment, should train for peace. This is the summary of the exposition of the six elements. Monk, this person consists of six elements, so it was said, and with reference to what was this said. There are the earth element, the water element, the fire element, the air element, the space element, and the consciousness element. So it was with reference to this that it was said, monk, this person consists of six elements. Monk, this person consists of six bases of contact, so it was said. And with reference to what was this said, there are the base of eye contact, the base of ear contact, the base of nose contact, the base of tongue contact, the base of body contact, and base, the base of mind contact. So it was with reference to this that it was said, monk, this person consists of six bases of contact. You'll get to learn more in a bit. Monk, this person consists of 18 kinds of mental exploration. So it was said, and with reference to what was this said? On seeing a form with the eye, one explores a form productive of joy. One explores a form productive of grief. One explores a form productive of equanimity. On hearing a sound with the ear, on smelling an odor with the nose, on tasting a flavor with the tongue, on touching a tangible with the body, on cognizing a mind object with mind, one explores mind object productive of joy. One explores a mind object productive of grief. One explores a mind object productive of equanimity. So it was with reference to this that it was said, Monk, this person consists of 18 kinds of mental exploration. <coughs> Monk, this person has four foundations, so it was said. And with reference to what was it said, there are the foundation of wisdom, the foundation of truth, the foundation of relinquishment, and the foundation of peace. Different foundations than what you thought, isn't it? <laughs> wisdom, truth, relinquishment, peace. So it was with reference to this that it was said, Monk, this person has four foundations. One should not neglect wisdom, should preserve truth, should cultivate relinquishment, and should train for peace. 
so it was said and with reference to what was this said how monks does one not neglect wisdom there are these six elements the earth element water element fire element air element space element and consciousness element what monk is the earth element the earth element may be either internal or external what is the internal earth element whatever internally belonging to oneself is solid solidified and clung to that is head hairs body hairs nails teeth skin flesh sinew bones bone marrow kidneys heart liver diaphragm spleen lungs intestines mesentery contents of the stomach feces or whatever else internally belonging to oneself is solid solidified and clung to this is called the internal earth element now both the internal earth element and the external earth element are simply earth element and what should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom thus this is not mine this I am not this is not myself when one sees it thus as it actually is with proper wisdom one becomes disenchanted with the earth element and makes the mind dispassionate towards the earth element now, this is a different practice than the casino practice we're just talking about elements here and when uh, people practice vipassana to them the earth element is hard or soft okay and those are external earth elements but the internal are all of these different body parts there is a meditation in the Satipatthana Sutta that I didn't really go into very much and that is called uh, disgust of the body and it has all of these different uh, earth element water element fire element air element in it this is a meditation that is very useful for people that are a lust type of personality and there are different ways of looking at what a lust type personality is they do things very carefully they do things very quickly and very neatly they always wear their robes perfectly when they're eating food they always take the right amount of rice with the right amount of curry when they're walking they walk very smoothly um, they're the kind of people that has a lot of lust arising in it in them so to put them in balance they have to recognize the disgusting nature of their own body because they are quite attached to their body now I was teaching a lot of uh, college students when I was in Malaysia and they were 18 19 20 years old and their hormones were really raging they had lust coming up a lot so instead of teaching them this meditation I told them when they're sitting 
if somebody that they're attracted to walks by and they start thinking about that person and how beautiful they are and all of their their skin is so perfect and all of that then I told them in their mind's eye turn them inside out and where is the beauty do you see a beautiful liver or my your intestines are wonderful see how that takes your mind away from the lust and all of a sudden it just settles down so that's what I was telling them to do when when lust arose so they could keep balance in their mind <clears throat> what monk is the water element the water element be, may either be internal or external what is the internal water element whatever internally belonging to oneself is water watery and clung to that is now this was the part that always got my mind back in balance when you consider that a body is made up of bile phlegm pus blood sweat fat tears grease spittle snot oil of the joints urine and whatever else is whatever else internally belonging to oneself is water watery and clung to this is called the internal water element now both the internal water element and the external water element are simply water element that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom thus this is not mine this I am not this is not myself when you start taking the body the concept of the body and start breaking it down into little tiny pieces because that's all it is it takes away the belief that this is you where are you are you the brain are you the heart no those are just physical things where are you when one sees it thus as it actually is with proper wisdom one becomes disenchanted with the earth element and makes the mind dispassionate towards the excuse me I said earth element and it was water element and makes the mind dispassionate towards the water element what monk is the fire element the fire element may be either internal or external what is the internal fire element whatever internally belonging to oneself is fire fiery and clung to that is that by which one is warmed ages and is consumed and that by which what is eaten drunk and consumed and tasted gets completely digested or whatever else internally belonging to oneself is fire fiery and clung to this is called the internal fire element now both the internal fire element and the external fire element are simply fire element and that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom thus this is not mine this I am not this is not myself so there's no small part of this physical body that is you everything is just parts that's all it is when one sees it thus as it actually is with proper wisdom one becomes disenchanted with the fire element and makes a mind dispassionate towards the fire element <clears throat> what monk is the air element 
the air element may be either internal or external. What is the internal air element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is air, airy and clung to. That is upgoing winds, downgoing winds, winds in the belly, winds in the bowel, winds that course through the limbs in breath and out breath or whatever else belonging to oneself is air airy and clung to this is called the internal air element now uh, when you're practicing straight vipassana they say the air element is movement and vibration now this is talking about in the body internally but when you get right down to it, that is by far the biggest element, movement and vibration. Sit still, can you? The earth is moving. All of the little molecules and atoms and electrons and quarks and all of these things are all moving. See how, how deep you can go into the subtleness of the air element and the vibration. And when I'm talking about getting into neither perception nor non-perception, and seeing vibration. You're seeing very subtle, little tiny vibrations. And as soon as you see them, you relax and let it be. Then they get smaller and more subtle. But th these are all considered air elements. Now, both the internal air element and external air element are simply air element. And what should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom thus, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. When one sees it thus as it actually is with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the air element and makes the mind dispassionate towards the air element, towards vibration, movement. What monks, or what monk is the space element? The space element may either be internal or external. What is the internal space element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is space, spatial and clung to. That is the holes of the ears, the nostrils, the door of the mouth, and what aperture whereby what is eaten, drunk, and consumed and tasted gets swallowed, and where it collects and whereby it is excreted from below or whatever else internally belonging to oneself is space, spatial, and clung to. This is called the internal space element. Now both the internal space element and the external space element are simply space element. And that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom. This is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. When one sees it thus as it actually is with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the space element and makes the mind dispassionate towards the space element. Then there remains only consciousness purified and bright when you use the six R's. What does one cognize with that consciousness? One cognizes this is pleasant, one cognizes this is painful, 
one cognizes this is neither painful nor pleasant. It depends, in dependence on contact to be felt as pleasant, there arises a pleasant feeling. When one feels a pleasant feeling, one understands, I feel a pleasant feeling. One understands with the cessation of that same contact to be felt as pleasant is corresponding feeling. The pleasant feeling that arose in dependence on that contact to be felt as pleasant ceases and subsides. In dependence on contact to be felt as painful there arises a painful feeling. When one feels a painful feeling, one understands, I feel a painful feeling. One understands with the cessation of that same contact to be felt as pain, painful. It's corresponding feeling, the painful feeling that arose in dependence on that contact to be felt as painful, ceases and subsides. Independence on a contact to be felt, neither painful nor pleasant. There arises a neither painful nor pleasant feeling. When one feels a neither painful nor pleasant feeling, one understands, I feel a neither painful nor pleasant feeling. One understands with the cessation of that same contact to be felt as neither painful nor pleasant. Its corresponding feeling, the, the neither painful nor pleasant feeling that arose in dependence on that contact to be felt as neither painful nor pleasant, ceases and subsides. Monk, just as from the contact and friction of two fire sticks, heat is generated. <clears throat> and fire is produced. With the separation, uh, disjunction of these two fire sticks, the corresponding heat ceases and subsides. So too, independence on contact to be felt as pleasant, to be felt as painful, to be felt as neither painful nor pleasant, there arises a neither painful nor pleasant feeling. One understands with the cessation of that same contact to be felt as painful as neither painful nor pleasant. Its corresponding feeling ceases and subsides. Then there remains only equanimity, purified and bright, malleable, wieldy and radiant. Suppose a monk is skilled, uh, suppose monk a skilled goldsmith or his apprentice were to prepare a furnace, heat up the uh, crucible, and take some gold with tongs and put it in the crucible. From time to time he would blow on it. From time to time he would sprinkle water on it. And from time to time he would just look on the gold would become refined, well refined, completely refined, faultless, rid of dross, malleable, wieldy, and radiant. Then whatever kind of ornament he wished to make from it, whether a gold chain or earrings or necklace or gold garland, golden garland, it would serve his purpose. So too, monk, then there remains only equanimity, purified and bright, malleable, wieldy, and radiant. He understands thus, if I were to direct this equanimity, so purified and bright, to the base of infinite space, 
and to develop my mind accordingly, then this equanimity of mind supported by that base, craving and clinging to it, would remain for a very long time. If I were to direct this equanimity so purified and bright to the base of infinite consciousness, to the base of nothingness, to the base of neither perception nor non-perception, and to develop my mind accordingly, then this equanimity of mind supported by that base, clinging to it, would remain for a very long time. So, what we're trying to develop here is a mind that doesn't crave and cling to anything. Okay? You're not trying to make it last for a long time, although it can. But you're not trying to control it. Why? Is that feeling you? Is that yours? Is that yourself? No, it's just what it is. And it has developed on its own by itself because the conditions that you provide it are correct. He understands thus, if I were to direct this equanimity so purified and bright, to the base of infinite space and to develop mind accordingly, this would be conditioned. If I were to di direct this equanimity so purified and bright to the base of infinite consciousness, to the base of nothingness, to the base of neither perception nor non-perception, and develop my mind accordingly, this would be conditioned. He does not form any condition or generate any formation tending towards either being or non-being. It doesn't matter at that time, just staying on the object of meditation, those kind of things don't even come up. Since he does not form any condition or generate any formation tending towards neither being nor non-being, he does not crave or cling to anything. Excuse me, I stopped too soon. He does not crave or cling to anything in this world. When he does not crave and cling, he is not agitated. When he is not agitated, he personally attains Nibbana. He understands, uh, understands thus, birth is destroyed, the holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more coming to any state of being. If he feels a pleasant feeling, he understands it is impermanent. There is no holding to it. There is no delight in it. If he feels a painful feeling, he understands it is impermanent. There is no holding to it. There is no delight in it. If he feels a neither painful nor pleasant feeling, he understands it is impermanent. There's no holding to it. There is no delight in it. If he feels a pleasant feeling, he feels it detached. It's just a pleasant feeling. Oh, hum, who cares? It's just a feeling. If he feels a painful feeling, he feels detached from it. What are we talking about? We're talking about not having any desire to control it at all. Just allow it to be. Because it's nothing. It's only a feeling. If he understands a neither painful nor pleasant feeling, he feels detached from it. 
when he feels this uh, feeling terminating with the body, he understands, I feel a feeling terminating with the body. When he feels a feeling terminating with life, he understands, I feel a feeling terminating with life. He understands on the dissolution of the body at, with the ending of all life, all that is felt not being delighted in will become cool right there. What's one of the definitions of craving? Heat. See? Monk. Just as an oil lamp burns in dependence on oil and a wick, and when the oil and wick are used up, if it does not get any more fuel, it is extinguished from lack of fuel. So too, when he feels a feeling terminating with the body, a feeling terminating with life, he understands, I feel a feeling terminating with life. He understands on the dissolution of the body with the ending of life, all that is felt not being delighted in will become cool right then. Therefore, a monk possessing this wisdom possesses supreme foundation of wisdom. For this monk is the supreme noble wisdom, namely the knowledge of the destruction of all suffering. His deliverance being found, founded on, upon truth is unshakable, for that is false monk, which has decept, a deceptive nature, and that is true, which has an undeceptive nature, Nibbana. Therefore, a monk possessing this truth, possessing the supreme foundation of truth, for this monk is the supreme noble truth, namely Nibbana, which has an undeceptive nature. Formerly, when he was ignorant, he undertook and accepted acquisitions. Now he has abandoned them, cut them off at the root, made them like a palm stump, done away with them so that they are no longer subject to future arising. Therefore, monk, possessing this relinquishment possesses the supreme foundation of relinquishment, for this monk is the supreme noble relinquishment, namely the relinquishing of all acquisitions all acquisitions is referring to belief in a personal self. Formerly, when he was ignorant, he experienced covetousness, desire, and lust. Now he has abandoned them, cut them off at the root, made like a palm stump, done away with them, so they are no longer subject to future arising. Formerly, when he was ignorant, he experienced anger, ill will, and hate. Now he has abandoned them, cut them off at the root, made them like a palm stump, done away with them so that they are no longer subject to future arising. Formerly, when he was ignorant, he experienced ignorance and delusion. Now he has abandoned them, cut them off at the root, made them like a palm stump, done away with them so they're no longer subject to future arising. Therefore, a monk possessing this peace, possessing this supreme foundation of peace, for this monk is the supreme foundation of peace, namely the pacification of lust, hatred, and delusion. The letting go 
of craving. So it was with reference to this that it was said, one should not neglect wisdom. One should preserve truth, should cultivate relinquishment, and should train for peace. The tides of conceiving do not sweep over one who stands upon these foundations. When the tides of conceiving no longer sweep over him, he is called a sage of peace. So it was said, and with reference to what was this said, Monk, I am, is conceiving. I am, this is conceiving. I shall be, is conceiving. I shall not be, is conceiving. I shall be possessed of form, is conceiving. I shall be formless, is conceiving. I shall be percipient, is conceiving. I shall be non-percipient, is conceiving. I shall be neither perci percipient nor non-percipient, is conceiving. Conceiving is a disease. Conceiving is a tumor. Conceiving is a dart. By overcoming all conceivings, monk, one is called a sage at peace. And the stage, sage at peace is not born, does not age, does not die, he is not shaken, and does not yearn. For there is nothing present in him by which he might be born. Not being born, how should he age? Not aging, how should he die? Not dying, how would he be shaken? Not being shaken, why should he yearn? So it was with reference to this that it was said, the tides of conceiving do not sweep over one who stands upon these foundations. And when the tides of conceiving no longer sweep over him, he is called a sage at peace. Monk, bear in mind this brief exposition of the six elements. Thereupon the venerable Pukusati thought, Indeed, the teacher has come to me. The sublime one has come to me. The fully awakened one has come to me. When he, then he rose from his seat, arranged his upper robe over one shoulder, and prostrating himself with his head at the blessed one's feet, he said, Venerable sir, a transgression overcame me, in that, like a fool, confused and blundering, I presumed to address the Blessed One as friend. Venerable sir, may the Blessed One forgive my transgression, seen as, as, as such for the sake of restraint in the future. Surely, monk, a transgression overcame you. In that, like a fool, confused and blundering, you presume, presume to address me as friend. But since you see your transgression as such and make amends in accordance with the Dhamma, we forgive you. The, it's the royal we. <clears throat> for it is grown in the noble ones, for it is, is growth in the noble ones' discipline. When one sees one's transgressions as such, make amends in accordance with the Dhamma and undertakes restraint in the future. Now, he can also be using we as himself and the Dhamma, not necessarily personally. 
Venerable sir, I would receive the full admission under the Blessed One. He's asking to become a monk. But are your bowl and robes complete, monk? Quite often when somebody would ask to be ordained uh, in front of the Buddha, as soon as they asked, robes and bowls would appear because in the past they donated those. Venerable sir, sir, my bowl and robes are not complete. Monk Tathagatas do not give the full admission to anyone whose bowl and robes are not complete. Then the Venerable Pukusati, having delighted and rejoiced in the Blessed One's words, rose from his seat after paying homage to the Blessed One, keeping him on his right. He departed in order to search for bowl and robes. Then, while the Venerable Pukusati was searching for a robe and bowl, a stray cow killed him. Actually, it was a bull. It wasn't a cow, but picky, picky. Then a number of monks went to the Blessed One. After paying homage to him, they sat down at one side and told him, Venerable Sir, the clansman Pukusati, who was given brief instruction by the Blessed One, has died. What is his destination? What is his future course? Monks, the clansman Pukusati was wise. He practiced in according with the Dhamma and did not trouble me in the interpretation of the Dhamma. With the destruction of the five lower fetters, the clan, clansman Pukusati has reappeared spontaneously in the pure abodes and will attain final Nibbana there without ever returning from that world. That's what the Blessed One said. The monks were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. So just by his listening to the Dhamma spoken by the Blessed One, Pukusati, became an, uh, an anagami, excuse me. But that, that seems like there would be some frustration about being killed by a bull. <laughs> but that's... <laughs> but the, there, there was a past karmic thing that happened and that's why that happened to him. So, there was a lot in there. This is one that I suggest that you study. I didn't stop and give a lot of explanation because I want you to stop and study and come up with your own explanations. And it is one of my favorite stories. <laughs> Anything else? Let's share some merit then. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.